scripture and with God. Thank you, Allison. And, um, and then we will spend some time in conversation. The first half of our time together is really a time for you all to bring um, questions or what's on your heart or what have you heard? What would you like to hear from uh, the bishop, Laura, or myself, or somebody else on uh, the comments team? Uh, really, it's your agenda to bring into the room what is on your heart and mind. We try to save announcements for the good of the whole for the last part of um, our phone call. We could spend all of our time talking about what's going on in the life of our local congregations, and we'd love to do that, but we also want to make sure we have plenty of time um, to talk about larger questions that affect us all as the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. I think that's it, Bishop Laura. Great. Welcome right. back. Thank you. It's nice to be back and give some updates um, after our prayer time. So we'll uh, offer the opening prayer for this coming Sunday. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts. For as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The dwelling in the word passage for this morning is Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Bishop Jeff will read the passage for the first time. And as you hear the passage being read, I invite you to pray with the Lord. May God be inviting you, what word or phrase might God be calling you to notice? Um, is there a word or phrase that gives you pause and invites you to deepen your prayer and your connection with the Lord? I'll offer the reading the second time, and then I invite you to, to pray with the Lord. Is God calling you to try on something new or deepen a practice that you've been exploring? What is, what is God saying to you personally in this passage? Feel free to share your thoughts and reflections in the chat. Um, and after some time of reflection, reading, and praying in the chat, um, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Margie Baker will offer the prayer in French. Dylan Mello will offer the prayer in Spanish. And Bishop Jeff and I will offer the prayer in English. Bishop Jeff, over to you. A reading from Romans. Own no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not cover, covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratis gratify its desires.
reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I could invite Margie and Dylan to unmute. We'll offer together the Lord's Prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Also, let us pray. Our Father, Thank you, Dylan and Margie. Thank you all. It's so great to be back and be a community of prayer together again online. So thank you all for your 
your sharing and your prayer and your sharing in this this time. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Bishop. So now we turn our attention to whatever is on your hearts and minds, what questions you might be bringing to this uh, gathering, um, any counsel or advice or wisdom or what's on your hearts and uh, what would you like to bring into, into this space or shared conversation? Reminder, you can just raise your hand using a reaction button. Yes, Bob, good morning. Welcome. Just to invite you to unmute and come into the room and let us know who you are and where you're serving. Good morning. My name is. Oh, wait, sorry, Julia. We'll do Bob okay. and then Julia. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, my name is Bob Bergner. I am the rector at Grace and St. John's Church in Hamden. I'm also the convener of the Fostering Right Relationship Task Force and a member of the Journey of Discovery with Indigenous People Ministry Network. And as I mentioned before, we took a break over the summer. Those two organizations, along with um, the Office of the Canon for Mission Advocacy, Racial Justice and Reconciliation, will be hosting a field trip to the Institute of American Indian Studies in Washington, Connecticut on October 15th. So a field trip to the um, American Indian Studies Institute on October 15th. It's in Washington, and we will be meeting there at 1.30. So that should give everybody time after their morning worship to come join us. And then we'll be having a guided tour at the Institute and then moving over to Camp Washington, where we'll we, we will have a time of prayer and conversation, and then a delicious Camp Washington meal. So put that on your calendars, announce it to your parishes. We'll be sending out an Eventbrite invitation soon. Um, we will be asking for a $30 contribution for those events. The journey of discovery with indigenous people ministry network will be paying the remainder of the cost so we'll be asking attendees to pay approximately the half the cost there will be some scholarships available for those who cannot afford the 30 dollar um, suggested donation um, as well before that date we will be sending out some liturgical material and information about land acknowledgements that will be a particularly appropriate for Indigenous Peoples Day and also the Native American Heritage Month, which is the month of November. So we'll be posting all of that, I'd say within the next, give me 10 days, within the next 10 days. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. You can send me a chat or send me an email at robertbergner at yahoo.ca robertbergner at yahoo.ca thank you very much thank you and uh, i'm going to invite folks to uh remember that we're going to hold announcements of events to later in the meeting so that was a beautiful announcement that bob just gave us so when you are ready to give an announcement give it just like that um uh, and with all of the details and information. So thank you. Any, uh, Julia, good morning. Good morning, Bishop. How are you? I'm good morning, crying. Bishop Laura. <laughs> Julia. Um, I'm a junior. My name is Julia Johnson Roy. I am junior warden at St. Stephen's in Bloomfield. Um, Having a little frustration with uh, parishioners' uh, participation in the service, you know, no one to read the lessons or the gos uh, the uh, psalms or whatever. So, how do I help encourage people to step up and take um, a better leadership role in these areas? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Julia, and I know you're not alone in that right we are in a season where um i think we talked a, a little bit about it in the spring where folks coming in are 
in a season of really um, wanting to receive, right? Folks are exhausted, folks are hungry, they're longing. Um, and so the balance that normally exists in our communities between those who are in a season in their life where they're wanting to lead and give and offer, it's we're a little out of whack um, still. And so what it leaves us is with more community, with people, more people needing uh, and then there are people um, in feeling that they are in a place where they can give and offer. So I think it's a, a common struggle um, across not just our church, but in general, nonprofits and all across the board. Um, so I'm wondering if, uh, if anybody here in a similar situation um, in a congregation where you're have, you've had challenges uh, getting lay leadership and worship leaders um, engaged and and active and maybe anything any ideas you have to offer Julia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Julia. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. I know that. Um, He's been as I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking here at the Commons, we have Wednesday uh, staff Eucharist every week. And uh, Deb Kenny is our fearless um, Rhoda coordinator. And yet every week, even here at the Commons, with lots of callers walking around, Deb has to beg um, and ask who's available to um, to do the, the different roles in the service. So I think it's definitely a season we are in. Erica, did you have a response to Julia? Great, Thank you. welcome. Um, I have a suggestion that also may be a terrible suggestion. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a both and. Um, I recently was serving a curate at a small church, Christ Church in Trumbull. And often um, when I would walk in, we would have a lot of empty holes, you know, no one was gonna be reading or whatever. And so I started standing right as people were walking in and talking with people and then not volunteering people, but just sharing that we we have this space and I'm looking for someone who could read the prayers of the people with me. And um, having it be that really one-on-one -on -one invitation and probably being vested and all that made that um, a, a, a more comfortable invitation for people. But um, I ended up getting a lot of kids who were excited to do stuff. So it, it felt a little more like let's let's pick up our roles and put on a play instead of like um, something you had to have planned and really perfect ahead of time. And again, I could see the opposite. I could see that being pressuring and awkward, but it, it did work a couple Sundays for me very well. Thanks, Erica. I love that you were getting young people too. It's just magnificent. Marge, did you also have a response? Great, good morning. Good morning, uh, Margie Baker, the assistant rector at St. John's West Hartford. This is actually not one that we've done at St. John's, but it's one that my father used at his church. And it was that he would highlight the parts that he needed in a few bulletins <laughs> and put those out at the entrance so that you weren't necessarily asking, but people learned to expect that and they could like pick that up and then that was their part. Now, the challenge is that you might get the very same people always doing the same thing because they like it, but the role is filled. Yeah, that's great. I thought it was a secret, like you didn't know what part you had until you opened your bulletin. <laughs> oh no, but that's wonderful too. Surprise! <laughs> Ian, good morning. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, you're not muted, but I can't hear you. So there might be something wrong with your mic. Sure. That should be better. Yes, thank you. Yes, Ian Montgomery, St. Michael's Litchfield. Um, the opposite of what Margie said, and and, and um, is asking people. I've no matter how many times I've asked people to volunteer, the yield is I've always found has been slim. <laughs> uh, you know, put it, ask everybody to join in in a, a, a leaflet, and very infrequently I get a volunteer. Sometimes I do. However. What I've found is, and especially among newcomers, after a space of letting them just be newcomers, asking them to do something uh, can be really empowering and wonderful. And I've been informed here at St. Michael's, they have a tradition of a sort of progression of bringing up the elements when you're really new and then 
being an usher and then moving sort of onward to lector and server, lay Eucharistic minister, and the, the, the pinnacle is altar guild, apparently. Uh, so I just offer that as an opportunity. Ask people, as Jesus said, follow me. And sometimes they did. Actually, they always did. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Stephen. Uh, yes, I'm offering uh, this perspective from my background in, in the nonprofit world. And uh, one thing that we've, there's been a, a, a generational shift, um, and, and that is that people are less, are willing to do things, but they're less willing to join. Mm -hmm. So uh, that so that's a problem. In other words, you're not going to get as many people willing to be a lector and be on the schedule, but you might have to get people to do things uh, individually. And that's just a generational thing. Young people are not joining things. They're doing things, but they're just not as interested in being part of the establishment, if you will. Yeah, that's so a that, great point. And again, something we're seeing across. There's some also good suggestions in here. Um, it also reminded me that uh, at a parish I served uh, during the summer, we would let go of the rota and we had index cards uh, laminated index cards with all the service roles uh, at the back of the church. And um, so that as people came in, there was a visual of what roles were still um, available. And I'm just imagining what it would be like to do that and then to say, good morning, welcome. Our service will begin when there are no more index cards on, on this show, right? So, because I'm also aware that a lot of the folks who shared really great insights, uh, it it can make a difference when you're wearing a collar uh, that you are the one in inviting people to uh, serve. Uh, so maybe a little bit of a peer to peer. Here's what it is, and I do want to uh, draw your attention to the other good comments um, in the in the comment section. Tim, is this in response? Great. Good morning. You are muted, my friend. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Tim Hodep, your canon for mission advancement and coaching. And I want to remind all of us of um, this past April when we gathered for spring training and gathering at our cathedral for the in-person day, and Mary Foster Palmer was with us. And her program, Invite, Welcome, Connect, is all about how to learn, engage in some exciting new ways to be hospitable. And that includes uh, bringing people together to be able to participate more fully in the life of the parish, including everything that you might be doing in Bloomfield, Julia. And it would include all of the different parts of, of the service. So I would invite everyone to, to take a look at this. I'll put a link in the um, chat but also we've got several copies of her book here and it's truly accessible. It's for hospitality for everyone in the parish. It's how to re-engage hospitality in a meaningful way. And it's done with some real roots in a theological background about who are we as God's people and how are we called to go out there and work. So Invite, Welcome, Connect is all about doing that within the parish as well as beyond the walls of the parish. And this might have some real inklings for you. So if you'd like a copy of this book, let me know. And um, I will put a link in the chat that'll take you to Mary Foster Palmer's website. So that might be a way of, of looking at it. Thank you. Thanks you so much, everyone. Great. Julia, do you want to come back in? Welcome. You just need to unmute. Thank you for all your suggestions. I'm going to try some of those. And Tim, yes, I would like a copy. And even though I don't have a color, I have a really cute black and white outfit that should fit. <laughs> the there you go. There you go. I have no doubt. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Clearly, and also such a great question. This is one of those areas that we're paying attention to as we are figuring out how to more fully support uh, lay leadership and lay ministry in our congregations, because there is a lot of work landing on the shoulders of our lay leaders, particularly wardens um, in parishes, particularly those without consistent clergy leadership. So anything you learn from this, Julie, if you would bring back to us and let us know what works, 
uh, or or new ways of thinking about it, we would all be uh, better off for it. Thank you. What else is on people's mind or what else would you like us? Good morning, Bonnie. Yes, welcome. Good morning, Bonnie Matthews, uh, Deacon at our cathedral. Um, I cannot remember, and a retired deacon asked what time convention started on Friday. Um, if someone can can remind me or let me know, I would appreciate that. I think that's a great, great opening for uh, for our secretary of convention in the diocese to come on and give us a word about this year's convention. Stacy, good morning. Oh, Stacy went away. We'll bring Stacy back on when she gets um, when she gets back online for a word about convention. Anything else on people's mind? We will get to that question, Bonnie. Thank you for bringing that in the room. Anything else that folks are wondering about that you'd like hi, to hear? Hi, hi, hi. Oh, hi. Welcome back. Hi, I'm back. Sorry, everyone. I apologize. My computer clearly froze and did not want me to talk to you, but um, I really want to talk to you. Um, thank you so much, Bonnie. It's like we planned that segue. I am Stacy Cole, your secretary of the Diocese and Convention. Um, let me first respond to Bonnie's direct question of what time does convention start on Friday? Um, that is still being finalized, but we anticipate um, registration to open around two o'clock. Um, so it will be in the afternoon. We will be finalizing the schedule and sending it out soon, but it will be kind of mid-afternoon, or excuse me, registration and check-in will open uh, with our opening session happening shortly after that. So mid, mid-afternoon. Um, and again, like I said, we'll, the agenda will be going out shortly um, once we get that finalized. But while I have your attention, I would love to talk to you about a few other things with convention. Um, as you all, I hope, know, convention is coming up October 27th and 28th in Hartford at our convention center. The convention planning committee has been hard at work um, planning our convention. We're still getting the details put together, but we're planning a really wonderful, fun, engaging convention. And please know whether you are a delegate, clergy, or an Episcopalian in Connecticut, you are welcome and encouraged to come to our convention. While our elected delegates and clergy have vote, everyone has voice at our convention and everyone has the opportunity to come listen, learn, connect, and grow together. There's gonna to be lots of great stuff happening. A few things I wanna make you aware of. First of all, an important deadline that's coming, September 10th is the deadline to book hotel rooms under our discounted code. You can go to our website, um, episcopalct.org slash annual dash convention. Um, and that will get you to the room reservation. Please know you need to do that separate from your convention registration. And again, September 10th, very soon, is the deadline for your discounted room rate. After that, you're paying full freight and I cannot help you. That is beyond my powers. Um, Regular convention registration is open and continues to be open. I do encourage you to register. Uh, our early bird registration is still open for a few more weeks. So you still have that discounted code or excuse me, not code, discounted rate. Just go in straight registration is early bird still. Um, please do consider registering. As I said, even if you're not a delegate or clergy who are required to attend we are gonna have lots of good stuff good presentations and a lot of vision casting from our bishops where we will be hearing about what's next for the episcopal church in connecticut what's next bishop jeff what have i missed sorry i got a little thrown off by the computer stream <laughs> i think that's great I think that's great i just if i may want to add a word about um convention and 
one of the gifts that I think sometimes we can grow accustomed and complacent, uh, accustomed to and complacent with in the Episcopal Church is that we are a democratic church. And one of the incredible gifts is that the way the church changes and grows um, is through conventions at the diocesan level just like this. So as parish leaders, whether you are wardens or in a leadership team or clergy, please, now is the time to check in with your elected delegates to make sure that they um, know that it's coming, that they know how to register. And if they're not going to be there, it gives you time uh, to get your alternate delegates in place. But I, we would love to see 350, 356, uh, I think that's right, uh, delegates uh, this year. Um, and it's just a really important time and a reminder, of course, to clergy uh, that uh, it is an expected attendance uh, unless you get permission not to attend. So please, it is a grand opportunity to be with uh, Episcopalians across Connecticut. The, it will be um, live streamed. So that is yes. And we are actively working on uh, providing child care or child care room. Uh, yeah. So we are, that's actually an ask uh, we have of those of you who might have uh, a robust nursery or child care program at your parish. If you could imagine uh, those folks working for the diocese on that uh, convention weekend, will you please be in touch with Stacy uh, so that we can uh, put that plan? It is our our hope and our goal to be able to provide a professionally staffed uh, child care for convention. Yes, I and I do want to say I am particularly looking for somebody who can kind of head up um, that uh, that child care piece. So if you know anyone who could really help coordinate that in addition to those who would be willing to work in the space, please do email me. Um, I am putting my email address in the chat right now. If you have other questions, please feel free to ask and check out the website. Again, uh, episcopalct.org annual convention. Thank you. Thank you and so much, Rebecca, Stacey. Rebecca for letting me jump on her computer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I, oh, Bart, good morning. Do you have uh, a question for the whole? I do. Good morning, Bishop Mello. How Good are you, morning. Bishop Aarons? The last time I saw you, Bishop, you were out here with a sick child in one arm and teaching a repeat after me song with the other. So <laughs> it's how we do it at camp. Right? Oh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> nice to see you both. Um, just a, 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 um, a quick shout out for uh, Camp Washington is um, we're fortunate to be having the youth festival is starting again. Uh, it's the first time since uh, the days of COVID. Um, it will be September 16th, 17th. Um, young people ages, uh, our grades 8 through 12 are welcome to come to this event, which is generously has always been sponsored by the Bishop's Fund for Children, which allows us to offer this for young people for $30 um, for the overnight with all the meals, entertainment, et cetera. Uh, we, have a, we have food trucks. We have a DJ. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful time with young people. Uh, again, uh, grades 8 through 12. All the information is uh, on our website, campwashington.org. Also, um, this flyer that looks like this was sent to every parish in the diocese and worshiping community, which also has a QR code at the bottom. So you can post this and uh, people can just uh, register right from that spot. Um, just a, a quick backdrop to this, when we when we were building the youth festival, we had done it five years uh, prior to COVID. We had over 100 kids. The last time we did it, we currently have 27, two, seven registered. So this is a wonderful opportunity for young people from your parishes and their friends. It's a great opportunity for me to say, hey, I love Camp Washington. Um, come and do something that isn't real churchy. Come meet my friends and hang out and have fun with me. Uh, it's a wonderful way to build program and build momentum. So please, 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 please share this with, uh, with all the young people in your parish. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bart. And while you are on the call, um, I just uh, want on behalf of the entire diocese to applaud you and your team uh, for your work this summer. Um, you know, for those of you who 
don't know what a challenge uh, COVID presented uniquely to our summer camps. A lot of summer camps simply did not make it through uh, the COVID, and um, there we both were. Both Bishop Laura and I were able to spend some time there this morning and uh, this summer. And the the program is strong and exceptional with some new leadership and new ideas. And Bart, your your faithful um, presence up there really uh, helped this summer to be really spectacular and we look forward to um to next summer being even more um of what we know camp can be and what what you all long for it to be so thank you for your leadership thank you i deeply appreciate that um i want to uh also offer a couple of things that we wanted to check in with you all about one is you may have seen uh, a notice uh last week uh, that we have uh, hired a new canon to the ordinary for the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. And the candidate happens to be on this Zoom call this morning. So I would like to invite um, Canon Ranjit Matthews to come on and say a word. Ranjit. Thank you, Bishop Mello. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I am really honored uh, by you bishop you inviting me to to serve in this position and um just excited about it everybody and any ways in which i can serve you i know the bishop has just a really beautiful vision of meeting all of us where we are and if there's any way that i can help to support that that's what i want to be doing so i'm excited uh i i move into that position on october 1st so doing some some of the work of um, transition, you know, uh, from my current portfolio. And this is also to say, um, you know, as I leave this position, you know, I, I bring with me, you know, the lens around, you know, work of justice and equity into my, into my new role. So um, just wanted to just make that very clear. And uh, I'm excited about you know, serving as your as the current can to the ordinary. So thank you, Bishop Mel. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome, Ranjit. Thank you for saying yes. Uh, just to let you know, our plan is um, in the next little while to be able to identify an interim uh, canon to uh, follow Ranjit uh, so that that work does not um, uh, go fallow or uh, without leadership. And then the plan will be to have an interim until such a time as the new canon uh, we can do a search and a hire, but we didn't want there to be any time, uh, lag time in between um, when Ranjit leaves the position and a new person coming in. So there'll be more announcements of that um, in the next few weeks as we know more. But we wanted you to know that we are uh, doing what we can to make sure that that doesn't, um, that there's not a, a skip in that. Um, I want to say a word that some of you may be aware of, and some of this may be brand new news um, for many of you, which is um, Julia Ayala Harris, who is the president of the House of Deputies uh, for the Episcopal Church. She was elected at General Convention last summer. Uh, she is new uh, to that role as of last summer. She wrote a letter to all deputies in the House of Deputies, um, letting folks know that uh, last year at General Convention, uh, she was assaulted by a member of the House of Bishops uh, in the Convention Center while waiting to be introduced to the House of Bishops. Uh, that resulted, uh, that was witnessed by uh, at least one other, two other members of the House of Bishops uh, a Title IV process was enacted um, in that, and word came this summer after um, a year that that uh, Title IV case, the disposition of it was what is called no further action other than a pastoral response. I want to say a word about that because that is a, a phrase we use in all Title IV um, cases. It doesn't mean nothing. Um, it's uh, the wording, certainly, I think everybody agrees, uh, needs a little bit of attention because that's what it sounds like. A pastoral response can uh, have quite a bit of uh, consequence to it. Um, and uh, it's something that is used when uh, it's determined that it's not going to go through 
a conference panel or, um, or, or a hearing. So a, a word about that. And some question about whether or not uh, this process was uh, held to the standard that everybody expects um, a bishop or anybody, a member of the clergy would be held to. Uh, there were a group of bishops that wrote a letter uh, to the rest of the House of Bishops asking us to consider this at our upcoming House of Bishops meeting um, in a few weeks, which is now, so you know, online. It was to be in person in the Dominican Republic, but it is now online. Uh, that was signed by a, many, a, a number of bishops. Um, it went out pretty quickly, and there was about a 15-minute window uh, to sign it. So a lot of bishops did not see it. They were away on vacation or they just didn't see it when it came in. So if a bishop's name doesn't appear officially on that, it doesn't mean that the bishop doesn't support it. It wasn't meant to be a petition, um, but there was some question as to why, uh, why more bishops weren't signatories on that. We believe that that request has been heard uh, by those putting together the House of Bishops meeting in September and that we will spend some time. You may have seen most recently that the presiding bishop, Michael Curry, has a statement and a video uh, that's on social media and through the, um, uh, the Episcopal Church's uh, public affairs office, uh, where he is asking for the system that um, is in place to, do, to address such a question to do just that, do a little bit of a review of the Title IV process with bishops. Uh, to do a review of how it's gone and uh, where the where the problems are, um, and then make recommendations for um, uh, how we make that process uh, better and make sure that we're doing it justice, much the same way that we have been doing the Title IV review uh, work here in ECCT. So um, I wanted you at least to know if you start hearing word of that or if that's new information, it's all online. There's a lot, anytime something goes on social media, you know how uh, oftentimes that can get um, uh, complicated because there's different discussions happening. But I wanted you to at least hear it from us, uh, that we're aware of it, that we are supportive, that we are having this conversation at the House of Bishops and believe that this is a critical conversation to be having. Any comments or... This can be, um, uh, you know, the president of the House of, of Deputies, President Harris, so brave and courageous in her willingness uh, to share her story. We also are aware that when somebody shares a story like that, it can have um, effects on us personally. So if that's true for you, we encourage you to reach out and get support um, where it is available. And if you don't know where uh, that might be, to please be in touch with either Bishop Laura or, or myself. Finally, I, uh, if there's, are there any questions or comments? I don't want to move on before it's time. Okay. If you do, please be in touch with us directly. And um, I would love if you'd be willing uh, to do a little bit of what I did on my summer vacation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you, Jeff, for your good summary of the news we just heard. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. First of all. So um, I've been away. I uh, took some sabbatical time. I had a little bit of sabbatical time left. Um, some of you know I took sabbatical in 2019 with a plan to then walk the Camino um, as part of my sabbatical. And then COVID happened and um, all of that got put on hold. Uh, three years later, my body said, I don't think we want to do the Camino. Um, and so in July, I did a 30-day silent retreat um, in Morristown, New Jersey at a Jesuit retreat center doing the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. I had done the eight-day retreat um, in my last sabbatical up at Eastern Point, Texas, um, but had the opportunity to, to do this 30-day retreat. For those of you who are introverts uh, like myself, you might be imagining that's, that's fabulous. Extroverts offer some confusion as to a 30-day silent retreat. <laughs> what did you do for 30 days? Um, but it was it was really powerful. You, you spend some time, lots of time in prayer, exploring um, your life and the life, in Christ, life of Christ, um, spending a week on the birth and, and uh, adolescent narratives of our Lord, a week on his life and ministry, 
um, a week on the death and resurrection, particularly the passion narratives, and uh, and then a week on resurrection. So I got up every day at 5.30 and went for a run and then met with my spiritual director at um, 8.30 and would meet for a couple of hour and a half or so. She would assign five prayer periods for me to um, spend time with during the day, um, to spend time in prayer with the Lord, mostly grounded in scripture. Um, and so each prayer period was at least an hour. So that was the bulk of the day, um, was, uh, was spending time in prayer. It was really extraordinary. Um, and then get up in the morning, go for a run, meet with my spiritual director and, and uh, spend the time in prayer again, just really to reconnect with Jesus for that amount of time in that in that holy space was was such a blessing to me and to and to my to my soul. Mm -hmm. So um it's great to be back and I had a great vacation doing great fun things. Um it's great to be back and and to be in a very deeper place with with my relationship with the Lord and excited to share the fruits of that with all of you. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Beautiful. And I'm really glad you're back. <laughs> it's good to be back. <laughs> And I'm one of those people for whom I would rather jog <laughs> the show than, than do a 30-day retreat. But maybe I'll get there. I have aspirations for that. Um, I encourage you to put any announcements that we weren't able to make um, in the chat. Uh, there's some good uh, announcements going up there now. Please do review all the things that are uh, happening in the life uh, of the diocese. Uh, there is a diocesan event coming up this weekend. Uh, around Pride in Hartford. So um, if that is something that you want to know more about or get involved with, hopefully there's an announcement about that um, in the chat, or does somebody want to say anything about that? Ken Arantxa, is there anything to be said there? I think uh, the Reverend Dee Littlepage is going to make an announcement, Bishop Mello. Oh, great. Dee, if you are with us. Good morning. Good morning. I was trying to find the reaction button to raise my hand. Um, <laughs> So um, everyone is invited to our cathedral this Sunday at uh, 5 p.m. for a liturgy celebrating uh, God's abundance in LGBTQ plus lives. Um, you know, most, most pride is celebrated in June. And so the city of Hartford decided um, to celebrate in September uh, because June is so crowded. And so I know that, you know, for me, it's important that pride is something that's year round. It's not just one month or like, oh, okay, one parade. Um, and so Saturday, uh, there will be a tent, um, from, the, from our cathedral at the festival, which begins at noon. Um, so that's from noon to six. And then Sunday at 5 p.m. is the Eucharist where I'll be preaching and Bishop Mello will be uh, presiding. Um, and there's a chance just to come worship, celebrate, lament when it's necessary um, and be together. There will be validated parking at the MAT garage if parking is a concern. And it's at 5 p.m. So we hope that folks who are not from the Hartford area will still be willing to come up and join us to, in this uh kind of first celebration in our diocese in this kind of way. So hope to see you Sunday. Thank you, Dee. Looking forward to hearing the word. Mm -hmm. Anything else for our time together this morning? Hey. Closing prayer. Close with prayer. Found this prayer surfing the internet. Uh, from the Diocese of Central New York. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. This is a new school year. May we all meet this time of year with renewed commitment to our individual callings. May we continue to grow in wisdom, knowledge, curiosity, humility, confidence, and compassion, even when we're not in school. Help us to look toward the outskirts, towards the margins, for people in need of compassion and generosity. May we never stop including those who sit on the edge of the playground. May we never stop sharing our pencils and sandwiches with those in need. May we never cease to see your spirit and goodness in each person we meet. We pray in the name of Jesus, our great teacher, prophet, and Savior. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
The blessing of God Almighty, eternal majesty, incarnate word, and abiding spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. It is so good to be back with you all. Yay. We will be back on uh, the Wednesday morning Zoom call two weeks from today, which, if my math is correct, is September 20th. So we will be here again two weeks from today, September 20th. God bless you all. Let us know uh, if there's anything that comes up in between that we can be of support or help with and know that each one of you are in our prayers and we are grateful for you. God bless. Take care. Be well.